Welcome to the 2022 February Community Update. We will be discussing PinePhone Pro stuff, including advancements in custom modem firmware, as well as the PineNote and PineSoul. This is the video version of the Community Update, so this won't include everything, but it will give you the synopsis. Thanks to JF, Alex, Lucas, and Samuel for helping out, and also check out my channel, Pizza Loving Nerd, for more open source related content. To start off, the Pine Store will be coming back to life following Chinese New Year, although the support system is currently backtracked, so it may take some time before your ticket gets answered. We also held a live Q&A session on January 21st with the video on YouTube, Odyssey, and TIL vids. We are also going to do another better planned Q&A in April, with it being more inclusive with other chat protocols and live streaming it on more platforms. We also released the PinePhone survey report with some interesting results. Some of the most interesting findings included how popular XMO is as a PinePhone UI and how many people daily drive the PinePhone. Unfortunately, however, there has been more malware targeting the PinePhone that has been shared in our partner project chats these past few weeks. The investigation is ongoing, but we would like to remind people not to download files from unknown origins. There have also been a lot of fake PineSoul soldering irons being sold on the internet, and these fakes do have a Pine64 logo on them, so do look out for fake PineSouls. If you want to get an original Pine Soul, just make sure that the box for the Pine Soul matches the box from the Pine Store. Finally, Lucas has been around a lot less these past two months, and that is because he is setting up an EU-based Pine 64 store called Pine 64 EU. This will offer EU-based support, repair services, and some options not available in the Pine Store. This is something that has been in the pipeline for a while, but COVID delayed it, and it will take some more time for the store to become operational, but the business should launch sometime in late April or early May, so if you are interested in the progress, follow the Pine64EU Twitter account to get updates on the store's setup progress. The PinePhone Explorer Edition launch has been one of the smoothest device rollouts we've had in years. We announced it in October, laid out the roadmap for delivering the Explorer Edition by January 2020, and have succeeded. All phones ordered prior to January 18th have been dispatched and most are in the hands of their owners. We've also managed to get our shipment of the PinePhone keyboard and add-on cases out the door just before Chinese New Year. While the keyboard and add-on cases development and delivery isn't quite as much of a success story as that of the PinePhone Pro, we are happy for people to finally get them. Maggie's kernel tree now has some software improvements for the keyboard and Samuel has written a new driver to check the battery voltage which can be read from SysFS. You can also now set what wattage your case delivers to the phone from the keyboard which is useful for the PinePhone Pro since the default wattage is too slow to charge the PinePhone while using it. For those of you who ordered a PinePhone Pro or an add-on or keyboard case during Chinese New Year, please allow us some time to catch up with orders. Plasma Mobile recently had a new release featuring several UI improvements including a new revamped task switcher and quick settings panel. The app drawer has seen some improvements so that it runs better and apps can be removed from it. And the mobile power settings menu has received some fixes and there's been a ton of bug fixes and UI improvements in Plasma Mobile applications themselves. Currently in development is gesture based navigation and plans for redesigning the home screen. You can learn more about the new release on the Plasma Mobile blog. BigTorque has been working on custom firmware for the modem. Most of the time has been spent on re-implementing things the stock firmware did and trying to patch up things that didn't work so well. And since the PinePhone Pro and PinePhone do not have the modem integrated into the SoC, there has been some difficulties on getting things to work. However, it also gives opportunities in making it do things no other phone can. Recently, he implemented messaging and voice calling functionality in the modem's user space, which means that you can call or text the modem itself. This is just a proof of concept and only works correctly on modem manager based distros and has a limited set of commands and calls can only play a sound file on loop, but it opens up endless possibilities to develop functions such as knowing if someone is using the GPS without you knowing or having a modem call you in a predefined time so that you can have an excuse to get out of a meeting. If you are running the latest release, send the text HELP to plus zero one. 555-01-99999 to get a reply back with a list of functions. You've been able to install BigTor's command line firmware for a while, but you had to do some risky command line stuff to get it working. Well, work is being done to make the modem updatable through the Linux vendor firmware service using FWUPD. It took a long time to get it working since the modem update process is not documented and contains bugs, but these were solved and integrated into the firmware update modem manager and fastboot plugins. 
These patches have been submitted to their respective projects to make it work, and after some help from LVFS and firmware update maintainers, firmware updates through LVFS have been signed and properly tested by Dylan and Victor. This means that you can now update modem firmware through GNOME settings, KDE Discover, or the firmware update command line after switching to the community firmware branch. Note, this branch isn't supported by the modem vendor at all, but it provides stability improvements, enhancements, and the root exploit used by recent malware attacks to brick the modem has been fixed. Initial successful ePaper enablement on mainline-based Linux now works thanks to work done by Samuel and PG Wipeout. This allows partner projects to start work on porting their OSs to the Pinenote and adopting UIs for grayscale displays. KDE now has some units and has been working on apps for it, and at the moment developers are working on getting PIC also working to support drawing on the device, and the Plasma desktop already runs and with a high contrast theme it looks like a viable path to get KDE on ePaper. The device can also boot Fosh now using the DRM driver written by Samuel and should be in an OS image at some point in the future. Caleb from Postmarket OS also got Fosh working in high contrast mode. The default theme, however, cannot be modified since parts of the UI are hard-coded. XMO also works on the device and it will be interesting to see how that works. Wi-Fi Bluetooth and sound output also works with Bluetooth now using a different firmware to get it working, and this means that effectively all hardware components work on the Pine Note to a various degree, which is impressive considering how short of time the Pine Note has been in development. That said, GPU acceleration doesn't work on ePaper, so the UI is sluggish right now, and there's a need to create a standard for exposing refresh rates in order to get it to switch modes depending on what the user is doing, for example using higher refresh rates while scrolling. A2 mode doesn't work properly yet, which means writing on the Pine Note in Linux is not viable yet, but eventually DEs such as Plasma and Fosh should be able to support waveform switching themselves to adopt user activity. Progress is being made on this though with a mainline display driver supporting all the display's modes, and these modes determine the ability to independently update different parts of the screen at the cost of CPU and power usage. There is also a mode to run the panel at full speed with better image quality. There are some other issues that need to be addressing, such as a U-boot bug preventing it from automatically detecting a root file system, so users have to manually intervene with UART to get it booting. So there is a lot of work before you can read and write content on the Pine Note, but let's appreciate how much progress has been made in such few months. With the current progress being made, early adopters should be able to get their hands on the device late this year. IronOS has had two releases recently, which brings some great new features. 2.16 includes some fixes to temperature regulation, which allows the pine sole to heat up faster and hold the temperature more precisely. There's also been some refactoring and bug fixes with the USB power delivery stack that fix issues with some Type-C power supplies. 2.17 brings some new features, including a way to check if the VBus mod was performed correctly, which I will explain in a minute, and it also has a new debug menu showing raw values from a Hall effect sensor if one was added to the board. There's also some translation improvements, and you can now add a custom logo through a DFU file, and all the build tools can be ran on Alpine Linux now, meaning you can flash Iron OS from a PinePhone running Postmarket OS. A flashing utility designed to make updating the firmware easier is now under development by Gammy, and this supports updating the firmware of your PineSoul and is available on macOS and Windows with planned Linux support in the future. Shortly after the PineSoul was announced, there was some controversy over the voltage rating of the PineSoul. It was rated for 24 volts, but the chip for power delivery was not rated for more than 21 volts, with it sometimes dying when 24 volts was fed into it. The VBus mod is a fix for this issue. The pin on the USB power chip that connects it to the incoming power rail isn't used by IronOS, so it doesn't have to be connected. So, all you have to do for this mod is cut the trace going to the pin. For more info on this mod, please read the Pine64 blog for steps on how to do it. But, once you're done, you can use the Pine Soul with a 24 volt power supply without risk of damaging the iron. AffiniTime 1.8 was released last month with a lot more reliable pairing thanks to the secure pairing functionality. If you haven't done it yet, we strongly recommend updating to the latest version. The next release isn't ready yet, but developers are working day by day to add new features and fix bugs. You can get a preview of some of the new features by checking out the 1.9 milestone, including a new terminal watch face, airplane mode, and a rewrite of the documentation. Another cool project to highlight is this new AffiniTime simulator, allowing the whole AffiniTime UI to run on a PC. This allows developers to design and test apps directly on their PC without needing to test and debug changes on an actual Pine Time. It simulates the whole UI by reusing code from AffiniTime, and it replaces low-level hardware code to make it run on a desktop window. The PineDeal stack has been delayed from the Pine Store because of some issues of prototypes, and we were not able to make the LCD work, and there were a few issues flashing one of the boards. Luckily, we were able to fix these issues and move on to the next steps.
There is work being done on firmware that implements basic drivers for all onboard devices in order to test that the firmware is able to communicate with the board to test out that they are all working properly. This means developers can test if their board works properly and allows the production team to test boards at the Pine64 factories before shipping them. Once this is ready, Pine64 can start production on the Pineo stack. So, that's all of the news for today, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your month until our next update. See ya.